You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, your host. And we got a rare treat today. Doug Casey is back with us. You know him well. A really successful investor, counterthinker, a real thought leader, especially when it comes to why things are so messed up. You find his work in internationalman.com. And don't forget, to, you've got his video podcast on YouTube called Doug Casey's Take. Doug, it is really a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been a while. Uh, we are talking earlier. Is critical thinking endangered? Are we at a point in humanity where nobody thinks for themselves? Or perhaps have the recent events in China and elsewhere in the world where widespread protests, social unrest, maybe maybe that's a rebellion against the forces that want you to walk in lockstep and obey. Hmm. Well, it might be a rebellion, but I would point out that if it's a real rebellion, uh, a peasant revolt at this point, historically, they almost never, ever succeed. They're always put down. And I could actually give you a lot of historical examples of that. So the fact that we see a little bit of a revolt in China and maybe a couple other places isn't a real cause for optimism. Uh, but there is cause for even more pessimism at this point, because uh, as I think we talked about perhaps the last time, uh, the real problem in the world today is the growth of the state. And the state is not a good thing. It's pure coercion. It's organized coercion. And uh, for the last hundred years or so, states all over the world have just grown like topsy from taking five or 10% of the economies of the countries that they govern to now 50% in most cases. And uh, that's a really bad thing. But we were talking about critical thinking. And perhaps the reason that people have allowed these states to grow the way they have is because people are not thinking critically. They're not reasoning things out. They know nothing about economics. They know very little about history. And they like the idea of a cornucopia that will take advantage. That will take, well, they do take advantage. They will, that will give them lots of stuff for free. So, of course, they vote for more free stuff. So, I guess the answer to the question is uh, there's not much cause for real hope at this time. I, we can talk about some possible reasons for hope in the future, but uh, I'm pretty pessimistic, Kerry. Well, you know, one thing that I've really been studying a lot as of recently is that uh, our food supply, I call it what passes for food. The average person has absolutely no concept of the lack of nutritional value in the calories that they ingest every day. This is just an area where it tastes good, I eat it, and I eat it, and I eat it, and I eat it. And we have this obesity epidemic. Do you think there's a link between obesity and lack of critical thinking? Hmm. Okay, how important is nutrition to your brain thinking logically and critically? Well, it's probably pretty important. Uh, but, you know, it seems to me there's lots of degradation all over the place from many sources. And mm -hmm. even though Americans eat mostly food-like substances, as you pointed out, uh, we're going to be a lot better off than people in Africa and the Middle East who really won't be eating any food at all in the future uh, for a lot of reasons that I can think of. Well, one of them is uh, it's not that the food won't exist. It's that prices are quite high. Like wheat is trading at over $7 a bushel right now. That's pretty high. And that means poor people can't afford it. And uh, I don't see any reason why that trend is going to turn around for lots of reasons. 
shortages of fertilizer, uh, the wars between the Ukraine and Russia. That's another. Uh, no, I, th I think the world could be uh, looking at very tough times from a, a food point of view. Right. So when we're talking about that, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, large chunk of uh, wheat that goes into the global markets has been cut off, and uh, also large amounts of fertilizer, uh, things that you need, the natural gas market disruption, which is a primary feedstock of fertilizer, also been disrupted. So supply chains in food are probably the the most urgent, but it's every supply chain uh, imaginable, really, Doug, is in tatters now. Yeah, and there are other reasons that contribute to exactly that. It's that <clears throat> the dollar is becoming less and less accepted by other countries around the world. And if you want to trade, you've got to trade with money. And uh, more and more countries don't want to accept dollars. Well, the Russians, for instance, have been cut out of the dollar market. Uh, and frankly, the Indians, the Chinese, the Iranians, anybody, every, the whole world runs on dollars today uh, to buy and sell. But most of these countries don't want to accept dollars. And that's because they saw what happened to the Russians. All their dollar assets were confiscated. So they're going to alternatives. Eventually, I think that's going to mean they're all going to go back to gold. But it's made trade a lot harder. The uh, fact that the world is breaking up into little blocks. So that, that's another contributing factor to the standard of living going down, I think. Right. So the dissolution or the dissolving of the globalist model, which has served the world in many respects extremely well since World War II, is now undermining a lot of the progress we've made since. Uh, is regional trade blocks, are they better? Are they superior to the globalist model? Because with globalist supply chains, we got globalism, and globalism seems to be dedicated towards uh, wiping out individual choice and freedom across the entire world. Are we better off without the globalist model? Well, you know, they say, and to a good degree, it's true, I think, that everything is manufactured in China today. Most pharmaceuticals, most steel, uh, most electronics, everything comes out of China today. They actually make stuff in factories. I'm not sure that we do that here in the United States anymore. Uh, mostly, this is a consumer society where we just buy and consume stuff. It, it, you know, as I drive across... It, the last time I drove across the country, I didn't see much evidence of much in the way of manufacturing anymore. The uh, activities that are, are mostly digital. But digital wealth isn't the kind of wealth that you can sit on or drive or live in. It's, um, it's a little bit different. So um, I, I'm very concerned about uh, the future of the U.S., then things like the government, we, we have Jacobins, actual Jacobins, the same character types that ran the French Revolution. Uh, these people want to cut back on production of oil and gas and replace it with windmills and solar power. Nothing wrong with windmills and solar power. They have a place, but uh, not for a mass industrial society. So that's going the wrong way. Uh, Every day when Congress, whether it be a state or a national uh, or a local uh, county or city uh, government group gets together, what do they do? They pass more regulations, which means raise costs for businessmen. That's not good either. Uh, taxes are, are going to go up because we have a $32 trillion deficit at this point. And the government's prime directive is to survive. And how can they do that except by extracting more wealth from uh, the people in their bailiwick? So uh, give me some bright side. I think our, I think your listeners probably want to hear some some bright side stuff. <laughs> I can think of a few things, but yeah. they don't they don't pop immediately to mind. There are a few, though. All right. So tell us the bright side, you know, because things a lot of things are getting better. Technology. 
You know, pretty yeah. soon you won't have to think anymore because you'll just use AI to write everything for you, right? Your next book, Doug, might be written by AI. Yeah, it, it really is wonderful. I've used this uh, chat I, AI, and it's quite marvelous. In fact, it's so good that it might be a reason to short sell Google at this point. I think they're going to wind up eating Google's lunch, which will be would, good. That would be nice. But um, how about good things that are that are going on? Well, you pointed something out just now about technology. There are two things that have that mankind has built all of its prosperity on since day one. Number one is the fact that we're a little bit like squirrels. We have a natural tendency to produce more than we consume and save the difference because winter's coming. And people naturally do that, even though they've been corrupted with welfare and things of this nature. We're all kind of wired that way. So that's why over time, the world has slowly gotten richer because of savings, number one. And number two is technology. And when you look at technology, starting with <clears throat> the taming of fire uh, several hundred thousand years ago, and then the invention of the bow a hundred thousand years ago, and it's been a slow but accelerating path. And then in the 18th century, with the Industrial Revolution, it's kind of past the knee, as they say, and it's been going perpendicular. But there are problems with that, because when people save today, what do they do? They save in terms of their local currency, dollars or euros or yen. But these are all just fiat paper currencies that are actually being destroyed at this point. You can't get a return on savings more than the rate that your natural currency is being destroyed at. So that's wiping away one of the you know, basic pillars of civilization and progress. It's the ability to save. And number two, I wonder if since technology today is so capital intensive, we're talking about, you know, not just kids in basements and garages, you know, that doesn't take much capital to do the kind of things that we used to do in the past. But so many projects now are billion dollar, multi-billion dollar projects. I wonder if there's not savings, that capital won't exist to finance these things. It could all collapse. So uh, the two good things that we have to look at are on shaky foundation from a historical point of view, I think. All right. Well, that is true. It is on shaky grounds. I just asked the, the chat to write a biography about you, to write an article, and it's in the process of doing it now. Uh, let's, let's read it. Doug Casey is a well-known investor, author, and entrepreneur in the world of finance. He is a strong advocate for gold and has been investing in the precious metal for over four decades. Casey is the founder and chairman of Casey Research, not always up to date, a company that provides investment inv analysis and research to clients through this company. He's been a vocal advocate for gold, arguing that it is one of the best. Oh, man, it's going here. It's giving me pages about you, Doug. Is that right? Huh. You'll have, to send, it. You'll have to send that to me. I don't I'll, use it I'll, myself up, so I I'll wouldn't post know. it, too. Listen to this. In conclusion... Doug Casey is a prominent figure in the world of finance and investing, known for his advocacy of gold and individual liberty. He is the founder and chairman of Casey Research, we already said that, and has written several books on the topics of investing and personal freedom. His contrarian outlook and strong beliefs have made him a respected voice in the investment community. I think, I think it's probably a female here doing this, a female AI. And it seems to me, Doug, she likes you. I think she does. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but that that's a pretty good stab for something, you know, who, who knows anything about you? If you, you know, AI, I think it, it might be our only hope. But the problem is, is it going to turn into like Skynet? Or are we going to have uh, Terminators? Are they just going to decide that the world will work a lot better without humans around? I mean, those are like legitimate fears based on science fiction uh, thrillers that we've all seen. But uh, it's got to make you think, Doug, you know? Don't just survive. Thrive. 
the Financial Survival Network. Fury Gold Mines is a Canada-focused exploration and development company committed to aggressively growing its scalable high-grade gold assets with major drill campaigns planned across its 3.5 million ounce portfolio. Fury is led by a management team of proven explorers and developers with a track record of success in advancing and financing project development. Fury Gold Mines is well positioned to create value for investors with low risk development growth and the potential for a new major discovery. Fury Gold Mines trades on the TSX and NYSE American under the ticker F-U-R-Y. To learn more, go to furygoldmines.com. That's furygoldmines.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. I think I think it's a race. A race is on because we we've got uh, the ruling classes. It to sound conspiratorial, but I think it's a fact. People on top, the kind of people that go to the World Economic Forum, kind of people that you know, rich and powerful and politically connected people that go to the World Economic Forum in Davos, <clears throat> they go to Bilderberg, the Council on Foreign Relations, and, and these people live in kind of an echo chamber. Uh, where they all believe that since they're masters of the universe, they should control all these plebeians down here. And uh, in fact, they do. They control all the world's governments, these people. Uh, they control academia. They control big corporations. Uh, they're everywhere. The entertainment business, sports, everything is Mm -hmm. kind of bending a knee to wokeism and so forth. So you've got you've got this, which is the powers of darkness. And then you've got just the average guy represented by things like the Canadian truckers strike, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, but, you know, it's like I said at the beginning when we were talking, peasant revolts almost always get crushed. And, and these bad guys have control of the apparatus of the state. And when you control the apparatus of the state, basically everybody does what you say. And the average guy does what he says. He doesn't want to get in trouble. He can't afford to lose his job. So people do what they're told. So um, the trend is negative and it's going to stay negative for some time. Maybe if Ray Kurzweil is right and the uh, Singularity happens in 20 years. Maybe that'll change everything because technology, although it's our enemy at the moment, has always, uh, in the long run, been the friend of the common man. So maybe it'll reach a tipping point and it'll go the other way. Yeah, I think a great point is uh, things might look bad. Uh, we don't really, you know, we know it from a narrow perspective of right now and where we are. But there are a lot of things on the way that we don't know anything about. And when you look back at technology, it's enabled the common man to live better than the royalty of 200 years ago, right? And even the, the gap, you know, yeah, granted, the, the wealthy have large homes and fleets of cars and all that. But the actual basic uh, necessities and accessories of life are pretty well distributed downstream now, which they never were before. And that, you know, the idea of giving somebody access in the Middle Ages uh, uh, to a mailing list of every, uh, every, I guess they don't really have newspapers back then, but whatever, information from globally available, even if it's somewhat distorted, it, it just could never happen because they weren't allowed to learn how to read and write. So. I think there is cause for hope in that regard. Well, and of course, you and I both reach out with a message of personal responsibility and personal freedom to people out there in the ether. And uh, perhaps some people who have ears here. And, uh, but it's really tough to change uh, the direction of a super tanker. And that's kind of the way I see the world and the direction it's headed at this point. But maybe when we reach a crisis, on the other hand, maybe this, maybe we'll go into a, a new dark age. Uh, if, if 
bad things happen. Like, for instance, this dust up between uh, the Ukraine and Russia gets out of control and turns into global thermonuclear war or global cyber war, because the whole world runs on computers at this point. If you destroy computer networks, it's going to destroy utilities and communication, and absolutely everything runs on them. And of course, the biggie, which nobody really talks about, uh, even in the e e even even in the wake of the recent COVID hysteria, is a bio war. I mean, uh, undoubtedly, every major country and probably a bunch of minor countries and a bunch of groups that so we don't even know who they are are working on stuff in their garages, which they can do, or labs, uh, to develop uh, some type of a virus or a bacteria that will wipe out select sections of the human race. Maybe Chinese wipe out all non-Chinese, well, you know, well, Caucasians try to wipe out, you know, all non-Caucasians. This is the kind of thing that could go on, and, and it could get quite ugly. So. Nobody's talking about these things, but they're the biggies out there. It's not just a collapse of the economy, I think, which is also a biggie, of course. Hey, so uh, I want to get your take on this Chinese uh, spy balloon. Um, the story has got so many holes in it, more holes than Swiss cheese. What is your take on exactly what happened here or is happening? You know, I can't figure it out uh, because... Everybody's got spy satellites. And of course, the Chinese are about as sophisticated as we are. I mean, they've been able to launch probes to the moon and Mars. So uh, it's no longer a primitive country. They don't need to float things around with the balloon mm -hmm. uh, if they want to see what's going on on the ground. Maybe it was kind of a uh, political stunt to yeah. see uh, what the Americans would do when when the balloon flew over to maybe it's a test of will as much as anything else. Yeah. I don't something. think there's anything they can learn that they can't from on the ground intelligence, you know, local mm -hmm. spies and spy satellites. So I don't see what purpose is served other than to uh, act as a test of political will and just to see what the Americans would do. Mm. Well, what do you think? Uh, one thing I will tell you is the last time I bought uh, any uh, Chinese balloons. It was for my kid's uh, birthday party many years ago. And they've come a long way in their balloon technology because those things used to pop. The second you filled them up, pop. They were like so unreliable. So I guess it's a testament to the advance of uh, China's technology that, uh, that they were able to get a balloon this far without going down. But, uh, but in seriousness, I, I don't know what to make of it because it seems pointless and, uh, you know, we don't use them and you can't control them because they're up there in the upper atmosphere and the currents, they can get going quite fast, but people don't know. Like, I think it was Branson who did the balloon ride around the world at one time, and he's going two, 300 miles an hour in the upper atmosphere because the the thing just gets sucked in and then, you know, you don't and really, you can't really steer it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't quite make a lot of sense. Uh, no, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, the last time that I heard of that an unwelcome balloon came over North America was during World War II. The Japanese tried to send hundreds of fire balloons over to start that, fires. That didn't work good. And, and, you know, it, it, you know it, it was an experiment. Started a few fires. Didn't work too well, but nothing since then. So. Perhaps there's been some evolution in, China, in technology that the Chinese are playing with. Mm. Yeah, you know, I just don't know what to think. But uh, but it gives people something to talk about that's pretty meaningless, not as depressing as war and all the other bad things that have been going on. So it's well, how about, how about uh, listen, how about this? In the last, um, the last boondoggle, well, they happen. There's so many of them so fast. But the, the most memorable one, the most important one, was what was this Build Back Better thing? Was that where it was that uh, <laughs> the Jacobins and Bidenistas passed? They, yeah. There's 87,000 new IRS agents that are slated 
to come online. 87,000 of these bed bugs to investigate everybody's financial affairs and with the intention of extracting more wealth from them. And nobody's talking about that, but it's a genuine fact. Well, here's my take on that. I don't believe they're ever going to hire those agents. They got 87 billion or something like that extra from the Congress. And what I think it's about is they're going to install AI systems. So human audits will be gone. The AI will look everything up and just send you a bill or send them out to lock you up. That's what I think. That's the underbelly, the dark underbelly of AI. But that's just my theory. And of course, it's a conspiracy theory. And we know that all conspiracy theories eventually are proven. Right, Doug? I think that's a pretty reasonable guess as to why it may come down, Carrie. You're quite correct. And if if you're assessed of money by the AI or by the agents or by both, they might have both. Um, if we have central bank digital currencies, which they're trying to put into effect before this year is over, all over the world, actually, they can just debit your account, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And then you try to go, you can sue them to get your money back, right? Good luck there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, the dystopian future is upon us, uh, but you still have, you can still think what you want. If you don't let them get into your head and you live your best life and you have good relationships and connections with people, you do things that are meaningful to you, uh, you're never really going to suffer. I think that's really the upshot what I've learned since all the hysteria over the past few years is every day is your opportunity to be free and you have to take advantage of it. Easy to say for an American, maybe it's harder for the Chinese or the Russians or people in other states uh, that don't ostensibly have the freedoms here, but that's what I've learned. Well, I think you're right. Um, one thing that I think everybody should consider is to spend less time watching the indoctrination on mainstream media in a number of ways, because this is kind of like a, uh, a multi-front war that the bad guys are mounting against the majority of humanity. And one major front is an economic front and a financial front and a military front and so forth. But a major front is a psychological front where you listen to all this garbage that is spewed out by the controlled media. And it's, you know, it, 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 it bends your will gradually, whether you mm -hmm. want it to or not. It's like a, a, a fish living in polluted water. Even if the fish tries to get away, it still is hurting him. And that's what's going on. So let's try to stay away from that. And I think, I think your advice of, you know, make sure you have good, solid friends that think rationally, think the right way. Surround yourself with good people. Because you've heard this, this aphorism that says that you're the average of the five people in the world that you're closest to. You know, and, and if you're hanging around with idiots, well, <laughs> you're the brightest guy. to be an average idiot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. And I think uh, it's so true. Uh, you know, keep your thoughts pure. Don't watch. Don't watch mainstream media news. Watch mainstream media programming as little as possible. And that is the first step towards having a, a critical mind and being able to think critically. And if you're a critical thinker, then you should go over to the internationalman.com, check out Doug's work, and watch his podcast on YouTube. And hey, if you've got a question for Doug, myself, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. And don't forget, sign up for your free newsletter at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Doug, always a pleasure. Be well. Thanks, Kerry. It was good talking to you. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.